All right, I guess I'll retest the 5820K then. Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today, due to popular demand, we're re-benchmarking the Core i7-5820K to see how it performs to more modern processors. I managed to grab one of these online for what equates to about $200 US, and that seems to be about the going price right now. Oh, and just quickly, a big thank you to all our patron supporters who make it possible for us to buy hardware like this for testing purposes. For those of you unaware, the 5820K was first released back in August of 2014 for what was a rather reasonable $390 US at the time. As the cheapest Haswell E processor, it packed 6 cores and thanks to hyperthreading support offered 12 threads. By default it worked at a base frequency of 3.3GHz, but depending on the workload would boost as high as 3.6GHz, though admittedly that's a pretty mild increase. In total, it packed 15 megabytes of L3 cache and 1.5 megabytes of L2 cache, and this was a significant increase over the mainstream Core i7 range. Although pin compatible with the previous generations, Ivy Bridge E and Sandy Bridge E, we still got an upgraded socket, LGA 2011 version 3. That said though, the socket change was somewhat justified this time as the Haswell E processors saw the adoption of DDR4 memory on Intel's high-end desktop platform. As was the case with the previous generations, quad-channel memory support remained and the official spec called for DDR4 2133. Since the release of the 5820K, we've seen the 6800K, which jacked the price up to $434 US. And then of course last year we got the 7800X, which went back down to $390 US. Last year we also got the Ryzen 5 1600, which has now been discounted to less than $200 US. And then the 8-core 16-thread R7 1700, which has also been recently discounted and now can be had for less than $300 US. What this means is Intel's high-end desktop platform actually faced some real competition in 2017, not something it's really ever seen. As is often the case, our testing will be focused on gaming, but we do plan to look at this from two different perspectives. Firstly, we want to show those of you that are currently using a 5820K if there's any advantage to upgrading to a more modern processor. If you're mostly gaming, is the 8700K worth jumping ship for, or should you wait? Given what we did recently see when testing the Haswell based 4770K, the answer at this point should be pretty clear, and that is just to wait. Clock for clock at 4.8GHz, the 4770K was just 15% slower at 1080p using the medium quality type settings with the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti. Using the maximum quality preset, reduced that margin to just 10%, and when increasing the GPU workload at 1440p, the margin was again reduced further to just 4%. So that being the case, I really don't expect to find much difference with the 5820K, but still you guys seem to love benchmark results and, well, so do I. So let's not let that little fact stop us, shall we? Moving on, the other goal is to provide second-hand shoppers with valuable information on whether the 5820K and an accompanying X99 motherboard are worth snapping up. At around $200 US, the 5820K is an attractive option, and supporting boards they seem to be selling for around $80 to $100 US. For testing, I've paired the 5820K with quad-channel DDR4 2666 memory. That's actually the highest memory speed the processor would work with, at least with the memory that I had available for testing. Then we have the 4770K, and that was tested using DDR3-2400 memory, and the 8700K was tested with DDR4-3200 memory. Before we jump into the gaming results, I've included some Cinebench R15 scores, along with some Corona benchmark results, and some power consumption figures as well. First up, a quick look at everyone's favourite rendering benchmark, Cinebench R15. Here the stock 5820K scored 6% lower than that of the R5-1600. The Ryzen CPU also posted a better single thread result as well. Still, overall they weren't drastically different. Then once overclocked, the 5820K hit 1305 points, and that placed it on par with the stock 7800X, and a whopping 21% behind the overclocked 8700K. So if you're wanting to increase your productivity performance, the 8700K will offer noticeable gains, though you're probably better off with a Skylake X processor such as the 7820X or perhaps even the Ryzen 7 CPU. 
Here's a look at the Corona results, and here we see that the 5820K is again only able to match the 700X once overclocked. That said though, in this test it does pull well ahead of the Ryzen 5 1600, and almost catches the R7 1700. Still, even overclocked, the 5820K was 10% slower than the stock 8700K, and 24% slower once the 8th gen processor was overclocked. Lastly, before jumping into the gaming results, here's a quick look at power consumption. Stock, the 5820K consumes slightly more power than the 8700K, as well as the 12-core 24-thread Threadripper 1920X, but also less than the 7800X. Overclocked, it sucked down the same 270 watts as the 5.2 GHz 8700K, so not extreme, but still at 4.6 GHz, the 5820K starts to get quite power hungry. All right, time for the games and kickstarting things is Ashes of the Benchmark, a favorite for testing CPU performance. Starting with the high quality settings at 1080p using the GTX 1080i, we see that the 5820K is very respectable, roughly matching the highly clocked 7700K. That said, it was up to 16% slow on the 8700K. Overclocking did help close the gap, and now it's really only the 1% low figure where the higher clocked 8700K holds an advantage. Going crazy with the quality settings certainly closes the gap right up, and now the overclock 5820K is on par with the rest of the 8th gen core processors due to a heavy GPU bottleneck. That said though, the stock 1% low figure for the 5820K did drop down to just 69 FPS. Then at 1440p, as expected, the GPU bottleneck grows even more extreme, and now even the stock 5820K doesn't really trail that far behind for the 1% low result. Assassin's Creed Origins is another very CPU demanding game, but out of the box the 5820K does reasonably well despite being much slower than the 7700K and all of the 8th gen series processors. That said though, overclocking did boost the average frame rate by 16%, and that's a nice gain right there. This placed the overclock 5820K almost on par with the Core i5-8400 for the average frame rate, though it was still slower for the minimum frame rate. Increasing the quality preset to ultra high closes down the margin, and now the overclock 5820K is just 7% slower than the fastest CPUs tested when comparing the minimum frame rate. Here we see that the margin remains pretty much the same even at 1440p, and while the overclock 5820K was able to match the overclock 4770K and the 7700K, it did trail the 8700K. Still overall strong performance from the aging 6 core CPU. Next up we have Battlefield 1, and using the medium quality preset at 1080p really gives the GTX 1080 Ti room to breathe. Overclocking the 5820K boosted the average frame rate by 13%, and this placed it on par with the stock 7700K. So a decent result, and it meant that we saw frame rates in excess of 120 FPS at all times. Now with the Ultra preset enabled, the Overclock 5820K is able to roughly match the Core i5-8600K, and it really only slips behind slightly for the 1% low result. Then we see something quite interesting when moving to the 1440p resolution. Here the Overclock 5820K falls behind the 4770K and Core i5-8400 when comparing the average frame rate, though the minimum is still very strong. And here we're just 10% slower than the overclocked 8700K, though admittedly, we're also quite GPU bound. Moving on, we have some Call of Duty World War II action, and here we see when using the normal quality settings that the 5820K does quite well, even before it's overclocked. Then once wound up to 4.6 GHz, it's able to match the Core i5-8400 with an impressive average frame rate of 200 FPS, and that's just 10% slower than the Core i7-8700K at 4.8 GHz. Interestingly, the margin actually grows with the extra quality settings in play, and now the overclocked 5820K is 14% slower than the overclocked 8700K. That said though, that's certainly not a significant margin, particularly given the 5820K is pushing well over 110 FPS at all times. Then at 1440p, we only see a very slight reduction in performance, as even here, we seem to be more CPU than GPU limited. The 5820K remains a little over 10% slower than the 8700K, and here we do see a 13% margin. The second last game we're going to be looking at is Project Cars 2, and here we are again starting with the medium quality settings at 1080p. Here we do find something rather unexpected. The overclock 5820K is able to max out the GTX 1080 Ti, and therefore match the overclocked 8700K. This is interesting because as you're about to see in a moment, the ultra quality settings seem to uh, impact CPU performance. So let's have a look at that. 
So as you can see here with the ultra quality settings enabled at 1080p, the overclock 5820K drops right down and in fact isn't much faster than its stock out of the box configuration. The overclocked 8700K though, that remains strong and here the 5820K was 16% slower. Then finally at 1440p we're now heavily GPU limited and as a result all test configurations come together with very little variation between the CPUs. The last game tested is Rainbow Six Siege, and here we see a nice 18% performance boost for the 5820K once overclocked. This meant using the medium quality settings, it was 12% slower than the overclocked 8700K, and with well over 180 FPS at all times, that's clearly a very good result for the older 6-core Intel CPU. Now with the ultra quality settings, the GTX 1080 Ti starts to limit performance of the overclocked 8700K, and as a result, the 5820K is now just 9% slower. Again, we only saw frame dips to 150 FPS, so an extremely smooth experience can be had with the 5820K in this title. Then as we often find at 1440p, even with an extreme GPU, we're still mostly limited by the graphics card, and here the 5820K is just 5% slower than the 7700K. So if you're playing at the 1440p resolution or greater, you're not really going to notice a difference. Right, so if you're still rocking a Core i7 5820K, do you need to upgrade? Well, in short, no. That's pretty much what we said at the start of the video based on testing recently done. So for those of you that follow the channel closely, that won't be much of a shocker. For gaming, the gains simply aren't there, but we will take a closer look at an average across all the games tested in a moment to get a really clear picture of what's going on there. But let's move away from gaming just for a moment and talk about productivity workloads. So if you've overclocked your 5820K to the max and you still find that it's not getting the job done quick enough, then yes, an upgrade can certainly help reduce workload times. For these productivity type workloads, the overclocked 8700K was 20 to 30% faster. So whether that's worth buying a new CPU, motherboard, and potentially higher clock DDR4 memory, well, that'll be for you to decide. The Ryzen 7 1700 is also $100 cheaper than the 8700K, and for mostly productivity workloads, it is as fast or faster with both CPUs overclocked. That said, there are certainly applications that still favor the Intel CPU, so be aware of that and make sure you research how these CPUs compare and the applications that you'll be using. If gaming is the focus and application performance is more of a secondary demand, then right now Intel is the best option, at least for flat out gaming performance of the latest and greatest GPUs. Here's a look at the average performance seen across the six games tested. The 5820K was just 10% slower and that's seen when using an extreme GPU with mild quality settings. That's certainly not a big margin and I can't imagine anyone would ditch their 5820K for that kind of gain. Under slightly more realistic conditions, we see just a 6% decline in performance when using the 5820K opposed to 8700K, and you can expect that margin to at least halve again when going to 4K, if not evaporate entirely. So it's not worth upgrading from the 5820K to anything newer for gaming, and that much we've pretty well established now. Productivity is a little more tricky, but that really comes down to how much money you're willing to invest to reduce downtime. And by going for something like the 8700K, you can reduce it by 20 to 30%, but it is quite a large cost to get that 20 or 30%. And because of that, I really feel if you are going to upgrade for uh, productivity reasons, I'd say you really are best off with eight or more cores to receive any sort of noteworthy upgrade. It really is a complicated buying decision. And while some people like to try and simplify it with, I suppose, their own personal bias by saying Intel is better or AMD is better, the truth really is far more complex than that. Anyway, let's not get bogged down in all that. We'll just move right along to secondhand shoppers. What should they do? Well, to answer this one, we're going to have to assume a few things here, but we're going to do so while remaining within the realm of realism. By this, I mean we're going to assume that the typical asking price for a Core i7-5820K and an X99 motherboard combo is between $250 and $300 US, and not quote some absurdly low price you're likely never going to find. I'm not going to worry about DDR4 memory because that's going to be mandatory for any of these upgrades, whether that be a secondhand 5820K or a new 8th gen core processor or perhaps even a Ryzen CPU. Considering the 8700K plus a basic Z370 board will set you back $500, that makes the 5820K option at least 40% cheaper. That's a big saving right there, especially given the performance difference for gamers is, well, negligible. 
Of course, second-hand hardware comes with obvious drawbacks, such as a lack of a warranty, for example. Still, 40% is a massive saving. Another alternative would be the Ryzen 7 1700, which when coupled with a decent B350 board that can support a 4 GHz overclock, should the CPU be good for that, that'll cost just $360. That means you'd be saving at most $100 when going for the second hand option, and realistically, it's probably going to be less than that. And while gaming performance will be as good or potentially even better with the 5820K, many productivity workloads will be boosted with the Ryzen 7 CPU. You also get a warranty with brand new parts, so that's certainly well worth mentioning. So for those reasons, I think I would shy away from the secondhand market for this kind of purchase. Additionally, there's also the security issues that come with the older Intel hardware, and we're not 100% sure when CPUs such as the 5820K will receive the required BIOS update, or perhaps rather I should say the supporting X99 motherboards will receive BIOS updates. I believe companies such as MSI did just roll out BIOS updates that do address the X99 motherboards, so that may not be an issue. You may be able to uh, mitigate those security issues with that BIOS update, but remember, doing so will come at around a 3 to 5% performance hit in games, uh, so definitely something worth noting. In short, if you're a gamer and you already have a 5820K, well, just keep it for now. Uh, if you're looking to buy one secondhand, then I suggest getting something cheaper like a Haswell Core i7 4770K or a 4790K. Unless you're getting the 5820K with motherboard for under $250 US, I really don't think I'd bother. There's also AMD's recent Ryzen price cuts that are worth taking into account because they make products such as the R5 1600 or the R7 1700 mighty tempting. But even then, it might pay to hold out for a few more months and see what the Ryzen refresh brings. And, well, that might either knock down the prices of the processors we currently have further, or there might be some better options available for people looking at building new systems. Anyway, that's going to do it for this one. Please hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. Consider supporting us directly on Patreon if you appreciate the work we do. And most of all, just thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.